Hi folks, big Kaiser digital boring head. This is why I do what I do. This is so cool. We have been hunting and improving our process over the past year, actually more than a year, on how we manufacture our fixture plates. And part of that involves drilling and precision machining a lot of holes. So when I went to Emo last October in Germany, card to that video here, one of my to-do list items was figure out, research, talk to people about drilling high quantities of holes and how to make really accurate, precise holes. We've tried a lot of different methods. To be honest, the Haas interpolates holes incredibly well. The problem is tool wear. This is 4140 that's been heat treated to about 30 Rockwell, so it's pretty tough. It actually machines beautifully, but it absolutely will wear out tools. Now we use cutter comp, which I'll talk about, to help combat that, but nevertheless, interpolation is not the right recipe for accurate holes and concentric holes. We looked into reamers, high-speed steel, carbide. Uh, there's even a really cool product called a padded reamer, like the Chef Cut from Cogsdill, which helps pad one side of the reamer to really give you an accurate hole. But ultimately, that wasn't a good recipe because of tool cost and tool wear. And again, going back to this concept of process reliability. Boring head was the answer. One reason is that the inserts, we're using really high-end Surmet inserts. They're like 10 to 15 bucks per insert. The key is then how do you create the recipe, the fees and speeds, and how you set that tool up reliably across thousands, if not tens of thousands of holes. So let's dive into that. From a hardware standpoint, one of the things I like about this Big Kaiser is I've got a thick boring tool, it's 10 millimeters, pretty close to the bore diameter that we're trying to make, and it's a short stick out. That means I've got the maximum stiffness. Here's the crazy thing, we still have tool deflection. It's not much, it's in the tenths, but I know it's there, so long as I can measure it, understand how that acts and what materials based on the pre-bore diameter, we're good to go. But that's part of the recipe. But the coolest thing absolutely about this tool is in fact simple. It's the screen. It's the fact that it's WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And it sounds simple. All we're really doing is two things. One, we don't have to read verniers. Reading verniers, we can do it this is so much easier. And I've always been a believer that the easier that a tool is to use, the more likely you are to embrace it and be proud of using it. That's great. The better thing is the fact that the screen is perfect on measurement. There's no concern about any inaccuracies in the screw of the adjustment and backlash. Because we're adjusting this head. We adjust for wear and we adjust when we run different materials in different sizes of holes. This tool has been 100% spot on. So let's walk through how do we get the hole ready for boring? How do we set the tool up? What is that recipe? And then finally, how do we measure and really confirm that we've got the diameter and concentricity that we need? One of the keys to a really good consistent bore diameter is the pre-bore diameter. So we check it with a set of gauge pins and we're looking for consistent fit from the first hole all the way to the last hole. And again, even though that's just a pre-bore diameter, we're trying to hold well under a thousandth of an inch of tolerance. And one of the ways that we do that is before the tool runs that in operation, we have it actually do a cutter comp update. So in Fusion 360, we've got a manual NC pass through that calls up that tool number with a Renishaw P9853 with certain variables that have it automatically go down and remeasure to update the Haas diameter value for that tool. And the Fusion 360 operation is using cutter comp to compensate for that tool diameter. Now we set our boring head diameter, again, depending on what material and hole size. So we've got these values that we know give us the final diameter that we want. So we grab one of those values, which we call the OTS value. That's the Renishaw tool setter. So 4749, we come up to the machine and in the Haas VPS, we've got a pre-written macro that's really easy that's gonna go down and measure the diameter that it's currently at.
So that gives us our value, in this case, 0.4747. So I need to bump that tool out to 10 thousandths of an inch, and that's what's awesome. So now we loosen the locking screw. Turn it on. We're at zero right now, and we're going to bump it up two tenths. I've got 50 millionths readout, and that's what's nice. If you go just a hair past, you can go back. Now, we don't tighten it with the same tool. We tighten it with a torque wrench. And that's yet another reason I love this tool is when you tighten it, it moves on you. So you're able to adjust it and see the value after you've tightened it down. And finally, those tool numbers show me or Jared or whoever's running this, how much we've bumped that insert out. And so we've got an internal threshold number where if we've had to adjust it too much, that tells us it's time to rotate the insert, which is perfect. Let's run that OTS again. four, seven, four, nine, every time. So I didn't even really appreciate how helpful that would be until we've had this tool and we've realized, oh my gosh, we rotate inserts or we switch inserts. We cut different materials. We have a different insert for the aluminum, a really nice ground positive insert versus the steel, which is the cermet. And then we do different size diameter boards. And this means we don't have to fight it. There's no iterating back and forth, guessing, checking the values on the OTS. We just do it once, we dial it in, and we're there. Okay, before we wrap up though, two last things. One, I am so excited for IMTS this year because what I wanna see is our people taking the next level with this. This is totally adequate for what we do, but I can't help but wonder, are we gonna close the gap, have a tool that can actually automatically adjust and talk to the controller so we can come in with our Renishaw, make a measurement, and then automatically adjust that diameter. So right now, we break this boring down into chunks and we do QC to make sure we don't scrap apart. This material is really expensive, and if you blow a tolerance, it's scrap. So speaking of QC, let's, how do we measure these holes? four different ways. We use Deltronic gauge pins. These are, from what I've been told and understand, the absolute best, not only on diameter, but on concentricity. I like how well they're marked. It's easy to read them. And they've got this point for holding them. I'm not sure if that does much. It doesn't appear to be anything like a thermal isolator, but these have been great and they're actually not expensive. 10 to 15 bucks per pin. We buy them in tense increments, and that gives us one method of checking. If we're setting up a new tool on a roughing up, we'll use our telescoping gauges as a transfer measurement tool, and then we'll check them with a micrometer, but that is not nearly as accurate as, again, as the gauge pins, or then what we use, which is a bore gauge. So this is really cool. We've got what's called a setting ring. So this is ground to, let's see here, that is within 20 millionths of half an inch. So we'll use that. And the way this works is it's actually a regular Mitsutoyu tense indicator with a plunger, and there's a mechanism in here that transfers the diameter motion of this pinching into the measurement of the hole. So we'll put that in there and we'll sweep the tool. And we make sure we're getting a zero read, like so. So that tells me we've got exactly half an inch within, well within one ten thousandth of an inch. And then we've got this set up for half an inch, so we'll go over to an inch plate here and we'll get our reading off of that. Obviously it's bigger than half an inch because most people using a plate are gonna wanna use dowel pins and dowel pins we have found are two to three tenths oversized and you need a little bit of cushion beyond that. So we normally aim for about 5005 to 5007 on our diameter bore size. One of the things that we've learned in metrology though is redundancy and checking your work. 
So we've got our Mitsutoyu bore gauge, which acts with the two points to, to check that diameter. We also have a dia test bore gauge set, which is similar where you've got a 10 thousandths indicator with a plunger, but it acts differently because you've got these nice radius bosses that pinch together. It's a little bit easier to use these inside of a hole like ours, where sometimes we're measuring after some threads have been cut. And then finally, as part of our final QC, we use our Mitutoyo height gauge. That can tell us bore diameter and it can tell us the location of those bores, so distance on center and ensuring that they're well within tolerance along the X and Y planes as well as relative to the outside of the plate. So folks, hope you learned, hope you enjoyed. This is what I love. It's technology, it's being created, it's being smart, and it's creating recipes and processes as we want to create these holes, we want to create these plates, and we want to do it super well. So as always, folks, thanks for watching. Take care. See you soon.